our last session of the day. Y'all excited? You had a good day? All right. Thank you, three people. That was very lovely. Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right, last session, demystifying SAUPs, a panel discussion on statewide agreed upon procedures. Our first instructor who will introduce our other instructors is Mr. Barry Kelly, who began working at LLA in 2012 and currently works on special projects team in local government services section of LLA. He helps prepare statewide agreed upon procedure updates, creates and monitors the implementation of statutorily required schedules, fulfills legislative requests and provides assistance to local officials and CPAs. Barry is a certified internal auditor and member of the Institute of Internal Auditors. Please welcome Mr. Barry Kelly. Good afternoon and welcome to the final session of the day. Um, we are going to be discussing statewide agreed upon procedures, which should be a very familiar topic to everyone here. Um, but we're going to do it a little bit differently this go around. Um, if you've been to prior presentations on this topic, um, you probably are familiar with us kind of going through each procedure one by one and kind of discussing what is being tested. Um, more recently, I've been doing a lot of presentations about the benefit that SAUPs can have for your entity. Uh, specifically, if you get exceptions to an SAUP procedure um, and how you can use that to help improve your internal controls. This is going to be a little bit different, and we hope that it can provide some additional insight to you all, uh, because today we're going to have, um, we're going to discuss the statewide agreed upon procedures um, from the perspective of the LLA, uh, which I will provide that perspective. Um, and we also have uh, these two gentlemen here who will be discussing uh, the statewide agreed upon procedures from the viewpoint of an auditor and an auditee. So uh, we hope that this can get, this can kind of give you guys some additional uh, insight that we aren't able to provide, being as we are not uh, be, uh, we as the LLA are not actually performing these procedures. Um, so having you know someone that's actually performing the procedures and having the procedures performed at their entity, uh, we hope that that can be helpful for you all. Oh, sorry. Um, we actually, if you had seen the previous uh, brochures, uh, you may have seen that the uh, we had a panelist, uh, Mayor Richard from the city of Scott was going to be a speaker, but he was unfortunately unable to attend today. So in his place, uh, Brandon Boylan has, has so graciously agreed to join our panel. Um, and I'm going to introduce Brandon and Brian next. Um, so uh, representing the auditor, perspective, we have uh, Brian Jobert, who is a CPA and a CGMA. He is a partner at Colder Slavin and Company with extensive experience in auditing, accounting, consulting, and taxation, specializing in audits of state and local governmental entities and nonprofit organizations. Um, and representing the auditee perspective, we have Brandon Boylan, who serves as the finance director for the city of Gonzales since 2019, where, the, where he enjoys helping the city achieve its goals by increasing efficiencies and strengthening internal controls and producing high quality financial reports. And then representing the Louisiana Legislative Auditor's perspective is myself, Barry Kelly, uh, and I joined the Legislative Auditor's Office in 2012 and currently work on the special projects team within the local government services section. And I have a, a plethora of different things that I'm responsible for, but for uh, purposes of today, let's just say I'm the, the point person at the office for the statewide agreed upon procedures. Before we begin the panel discussion, I do want to talk to you guys a little bit about the background of the SAUPs, as well as some of the updates we have recently made and some that have just been rolled out. Um, first, we'll start with some background information. So. The statewide agreed upon procedures were first required for entities with June 30th, 2017 year ends. So they've been around for a while now, uh, which is why you guys are so familiar with them. Um, there was a brief period due to COVID, which we did put a pause on the procedures, um, but that was the only time we've had that break. Um, so 
Um, they're effective for local governments and quasi-public organizations that have to submit audits to our office, which means that you have revenues of $500,000 or more during a year. Um, that means also that if you have revenues that are below that threshold and you have either a review attestation report or a compilation report or sworn financial statements, you are not required to do the SAUPs. It only applies to those that are uh, required to submit an audit to our office. The AUP, SAUPs are performed under the AICPA attest standards by the same firm that performs your annual audit and it is attached to, but it is a separate report from the annual audit report. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the process in which your auditor submits the reports to our office, um, but we have a portal which your auditor logs into and submits your report. They will submit your audit and your SAUP report as a single PDF file. So while there are two separate reports, technically they do submit it to our office as one single PDF file when they upload the document to our website. Uh, it goes through a review process and then that single PDF file is published on our website and made public um, once it goes through that review process. These are the 14 statewide agreed upon procedure categories. Um, this has been, these, these, these categories have been the same for a while now. Um, in a, a few years ago, we did add some categories and it's possible that we will add some in the future. It's also possible that some could come off at some point in the future, but there's no concrete plans for either one of those decisions at this time. Um, so I just say that to say, it's important for you guys to check every year to make sure that there haven't been any additions or, or subtractions from this list of categories. Um, but as it stands, you should be familiar with these 14 categories as they have been in place for several years now. So now I'll talk about recent changes that we've made within the past couple of years. Um, one of the changes we made was when we refer to these procedures and the applicability of these procedures, we no longer say for fiscal years ending 12-31-2023 or whatever that year may be. We are now saying fiscal years beginning on or after January 1 of each year. And the reason we've done that is to um, give ourselves more lead time and flexibility uh, when we want to make updates or changes to the SAUPs. We are also hoping that by, by doing this, we can encourage more multi-year engagements. Um, it's also possible that there may be a year where we don't make any changes to the SAUPs. And at that point, we won't have to, you know, issue any new, uh, SAUPs for that, that year. And the ones that have been issued can be, uh, applicable to multiple years. Um, also starting on March 1st of 2023, auditors, your auditors began recording in our database when they upload your report. Um, they started answering questions as to whether or not um, there was an exception found in each one of the 14 categories. Uh, basically, it's drop down menu for each of those categories and they say yes, no, or not applicable. Um, this is, you know, they also have several other questions they have to answer when they submit their reports to our office. But we added this because we wanted a better way to be able to keep track of what categories seem to be giving entities throughout the state more problems as far as resolving those exceptions. Um, we also are able to tell what in, or hope to be able to tell what entities are resolving their exceptions and which entities are not. Um, and we, we hope to be able to continue to gather that information and kind of be able to pinpoint exactly where the problems lie. Um, and if we do see that there are certain areas that seem to be giving entities more uh, problems, that may be an area where we can develop more resources to provide to you all, whether it be through additional trainings that we do at CLGE, or if it's some sort of uh, something that we can, a resource we can put on our website that may be able to help you all so solve some of the issues that you have, we will be able to use that data that your auditor provides us to kind of figure that out. Along those lines, uh, we put together this, uh, this graphic that just shows where we are seeing the exceptions. Now, this, this kind of covers one 12 month period between March uh, 2023 to, to March 2024. And it shows us where we are seeing the most exceptions. So of the 2,191 SAUP responses we received, which means that's, that's the number of reports we received, 
And now that number includes some entities that may that maybe had a reports due twice within that year period, uh, maybe counted twice in that number. But that's the number of uh, responses we received during that period. Um, the most common exception was in written policies and procedures, which is not surprising because it is the most, most lengthy procedure. There are a lot of areas tested in, in that uh, category. I will say that that should be one of the easier ones to correct. Um, a little bit of a tip for you, if you look at that, that written policy and procedure uh, category, if you adopt written policies and procedures that address the things that are, in, that are being tested, that exception will go away and you shouldn't have any repeat exceptions in that category as long as we don't add any new um, things to be tested under that category. So if you solve that one time, it should be kind of a long-term solve as far as the SAUP testing goes. Um, collections is number two with 13% of the total exceptions. Bank reconciliations, 12%. Non-payroll disbursements, 11%. Prevention of sexual harassment, 10%. Um, credit cards, 8%, and so on. Um, of the total uh, reports we received, 802 of the reports that we received had no exceptions. Um, we we want to increase that number as we go forward, right? We want everyone to work hard at correcting those exceptions and preventing exceptions so that that 802 number can increase and we can have a higher percentage of uh, reports that don't have exceptions. And to encourage that, we have rolled out a new policy that we hope will uh, encourage all of you all to, to work hard at correcting those exceptions and preventing those exceptions. Um, and we hope that this is something that you all uh, like. This is a bit of good news. Uh, we have heard the complaints that the SAUPs are additional money that you guys have to pay in addition to, <laughs> in addition to the audit that you're already paying for, right? Um, and we, we understand that. Though we do still believe that the SAUPs are beneficial and that they serve a, an important function. But we do want to reward those of you who are working hard to correct those exceptions and to prevent those exceptions. So we are introducing a policy that is going to, to have a uh, two-year cycle um, with the first year being um, for uh, entities, for fiscal years beginning in 2023. So the, that any, any fiscal year that began in 2023 will be considered year one for the first year of this implementation. Fiscal years beginning in 2024 will be considered the second year for this implementation. Um, and then we will start over with year one. During year one, every entity will have to have every, every um, area tested with no exceptions. Everyone has to get everything tested. But in year two, there is the uh, opportunity for each of your agencies to have reduced testing or no testing at all if you meet two criteria. The first criteria is that you need to submit your audit on time in year one. If your audit is submitted to our office on time in year one, you have met the first threshold. Uh, we have we added that criteria because we want to encourage you all to get that audit submitted on time, get it performed and get it submitted on time so that users of that that audit can um, be able to have more useful information. It doesn't really help them to have, you know, audits that are two years old being released two years late, right? Or a year late. We wanna get it into our office on time so that we can get it reviewed and published on our website. So that's the first criteria. The second criteria is you have to have areas where you have to have area, SAUP areas that have no exceptions. So technically, if you have no exceptions in year one and your audit is submitted on time, you will not have to have SAUPs performed in that second year. Um, so every other year, you have the opportunity to have reduced testing or no testing. But that will mean that you need to have your audit in on time in year one, and you will need to have, uh, you know, work hard at getting those, those exceptions resolved or prevented. Um, and I will say that when we say the audit has to be submitted on time, it's by the statutorily, uh, statutory due date. Or if there is an emergency extension, um, we will consider, and it's, and it's submitted by that ex emergency extension date, we will consider that to be on time. Non-emergency extensions will not 
count as being on time. Um, now, this applies to everybody. So in year two, because in year two, no one will have to have the information technology and disaster recovery um, and business continuity procedure tested. That will only be tested in year one going forward. The reason for that is because we do not currently require that your auditor uh, list the exceptions to that procedure in the report. Instead, they are currently required to say, we perform the testing and discuss the results with management. So there's no way for us to know um, whether or not you know there's an exception in any given year because we don't require it to be reported. So going forward in year two, you will not have to have uh, that area tested. So you will only have it tested every other year. And that's our little gift to you. That's why you see that little, that little gift there. <laughs> um, so the, 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 um, the benefit to you all by having this new policy is that you can have some cost savings. Um, and we hope that that encourages you guys to, 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 you know, get that, get those exceptions resolved and work hard at preventing them. Uh, because, again, if your audit is submitted by the statutory due date or by that emergency extension date and you don't have any exceptions, then you have no SAUP cost every other year. If you have, uh, if you get that report in on time and you have a few exceptions, you could have reduced testing every other year. Now, I will say, if you do not get your report in on time, you are subject to the full testing in year two. So it doesn't matter if you had no exceptions in year one. If your report is late, you have to get everything tested in year two. So if you, wanna, if you want to be able to take advantage of that cost savings, it's important to work hard to make sure that you can get that audit completed and in on time. Work with your auditors to make sure that you can get everything completed and submitted to our office on time. Um, and also take seriously those exceptions to those SAUPs, work hard at correcting them so that you can take advantage of this cost savings. Yes, Diane. So we have a question. If you can just clarify, Barry, the fiscal years. Mm -hmm. So when does this go into effect for which audits and what is that baseline year one, please? Okay, so the baseline year one will be fiscal years that began in 2000 calendar year 2003 so if you're if you have if you're a um a 1231 2023 fiscal year end that would mean that your fiscal year began in january of that year right so that would be your year one um if you're if you're a what if you're a um a 630 2024 fiscal year end then your fiscal year beginning would have been in July, right? So you, that would be your year one. So um, it really just depends on when your calendar year began. Um, the year two will mean that, I'm trying to get it right, these dates have been confusing me too. So if you're, your fiscal year two will be, um, if, if you have a fiscal year that begins in 2024. So, so if uh, you are, if you have a fiscal year that began in January of 2024, that will be your fiscal year. Uh, that will be your year two. I'm sorry. So, a 12-31-2024 fiscal year end will be your year two. Um, it's a tad bit confusing, but I will say if you go to our um, go to our website in the SAUP section, if you go into the FAQs, I put together a little graphic that explains year one, year two, year one, year two, and it breaks it out. Um, and it should make it clear for you as to the applicability of this new um, rollout. Um, all of the, the, the procedures are on our website now. It's called version seven. Um, the version seven procedures, uh, the instructions, the FAQs are, are all on the website currently. Um, and like I said, in the FAQs, there is a chart that can kind of break down what year falls into year one um, and what year falls into year two. And I've done it for like 10 years, I believe. So. You should be able to kind of see how that will work. Um, and now I want to just talk about some of the clarifications that we've made in this version seven um, of the SAUPs. Um, so we've had questions about random selections, and this probably won't have a whole lot to do with you as the entities. It's more of an auditor question. 
but we did want to just clarify that random selections may be made using a random number generator or an alternate method selected by the practitioner that results in an equivalent sample. Basically, those methods that are allowed under the AICPA audit guide, um, audit sample. Um, we also added some language to procedure two, which is the board or finance committee procedure. Uh, we've made it so that it's clear that we want um, all of the minutes for the year being tested to be looked at and reviewed by your auditor um, and that they should be looking to see that the board is being provided with budget to actual comparisons every month. Um, but we want to make sure that they are looking at all of the minutes to check to see if there were um, those comparisons were provided to the board every month. And then procedure number five, we, um, we added some, let's see, do we add a footnote? Yeah, we clarified to make sure that um, everyone was aware that when you're testing for non-payroll disbursements, we're only looking for those external disbursements. We're not looking at, we're not, we don't want your auditor looking at uh, transfers from one bank account to another. For instance, if you're making a transfer from an operating account to a payroll account, we would not consider that a non-payroll disbursement. Um, that was a question that we received a few times, so we just added some language to clarify that. And then in procedure number 13, uh, we, we got a lot of feedback on this one, and we realized that the way we had written it in version six was a little bit confusing uh, regarding the information technology disaster recovery uh, business continuity procedure. Um, we wanted to make sure that the auditors knew that going uh, when they perform this, we expect that for everything tested in that category, the response in the actual audit report will be, we perform the procedure and discuss the results with management. Um, as it stood in, in, in version six, it was a little confusing, um, and it appeared that we were only requiring that response for only about half of that procedure, when in actuality we wanted that response for everything tested under that procedure. Um, and we've said it before, but the reason we don't want the results of, your, of that category to be in your audit report is because we don't want to tip off the bad guys that may look at your audit report and say, oh, okay, they don't have you know a firewall or whatever. We don't want them to know where your weaknesses may lie so that they can take advantage of it. That is why it's not in the audit report. And uh, that's why we ask that the auditors only discuss those exceptions with you when they perform the procedures. Um, some general comments. That is the link where you can find the statewide agreed upon procedures. If you go to that website, you will see the current version of the um, procedures and the direct previous version of the procedures. If you need any um, other procedures from, from previous years before that, you can contact me and I can provide it to you. Um, so um, yeah, go to that website. And again, it has the FAQs. It has um, all the information you need related to the statewide agreed upon procedures. Uh, management must provide a written response to exceptions. If they do not provide a response to the exceptions, the auditor uh, has been instructed to say, to, you know, to put it in the report that management declined to provide uh, a response to those exceptions. And then only those SAUP exceptions that rise to the level of a significant deficiency or material weakness should be included as an audit finding. A lot of that will depend upon your auditor's professional judgment as to whether or not something meets the criteria uh, or rises to the level of an audit finding. I will tell you that most of the SAUP exceptions stand alone as SAUP exceptions and do not typically rise to the level of a, um, as an audit finding. That's not what we've seen. But there are occasions where there are certain things that would rise to the level of an audit finding. For instance, if in performing um, their SAUP testing, a fraud is discovered, obviously that likely will be become an audit finding, right? So um, they, they, they're two separate things, but they can, one can rise to the level of an audit finding. Yes. We have a question, I'm sorry. Backing up to the year one and year two mm -hmm. section, there was a slide about um, submitted on time mm -hmm. with an approved emergency exception. Mm -hmm. So can you go over when you, um, extension, can you go over the scenario of when you get an emergency extension and when you get a non-emergency okay. extension? So an emergency extension is gonna be when you have a gubernatorially 
uh, declared like disaster or something like that. So we have a major hurricane come through and there's a huge disaster that is preventing um, entities from being able to get their audit complete and it's declared a disaster by the governor. That would be when you'd be able to get an emergency extension. A non-emergency extension would be something like, you know, their turnover at, at your office or something that, that causes a delay in the audit. So for it to be an emergency extension, it needs to be declared by the governor. And um, typically that would be like some major disaster or pandemic, you know, things like that would be emergency uh, extensions. And um, that delayed your um, audit. That's non-emergency? Correct. Not, yeah. Absolutely <laughs> correct. It has to be a declared emergency by the governor. That's not a declared emergency by the governor, while it is a very real emergency to you. Yeah. So it's called, and that's just the law. The law permits only a, a gubernatorially declared emergency. So everything else is a non-emergency. So if you have a non-emergency extension, then um, then you did not submit your audit report by the statutory due date. So you don't get the exception in year two of not having to have some of your statewide AUPs that had no exceptions in year one. That doesn't that doesn't um, you're not qualified for that if you didn't get your audit report on in on time. Guess what we're trying to encourage you to get your audit reports in on time. That's right. Yes, ma'am. No problem. And then finally, I just want to talk about the objective of the uh, SAUP. Uh, since its implementation, I've heard the complaints uh, in person and on the phone from people saying that uh, their opinion, the SAUPs are duplicative of the work that's done in their audit. And it seems like an extra cost that is uh, unnecessary. Um, I will tell you that the reason that they were initially uh, developed was because there is a little bit of a gap in between what people perceive an audit to be and what an audit actually is. Um, because your auditor comes in and gives your audit a clean or unmodified opinion, that does not mean that the auditor is certifying that the financial statements are free from error or that no fraud occurred. Um, when your auditor is performing their audit, they're not looking at every transaction. Uh, they pull a sample of transactions to perform their testing. Um, also, there's this concept of materiality where they're only looking at um, you know, transactions over a certain dollar amount. Um, well, when we implemented the SAUPs, we removed that concept of materiality. There is no concept of materiality in the SAUPs. Um, they could literally look at a $2 transaction and test it. Um, that may seem to be kind of, you know, unimportant because the dollar amount is so low. But the idea is that if your internal controls are working, that two dollars should be, uh, you know, those internal controls should protect those two dollars from being misspent or stolen or misappropriated in any way. So if there's problems, if the controls are lacking at that two dollar level, then, you know, we want to make sure that you are aware of it so that you can work hard to correct that so that, you know, that that. $50,000 or $10,000 transaction has those internal controls in place to protect that money from being misappropriated or misspent. Um, the SAUPs require the auditor to take a more careful look at areas that may not end up in that sample uh, tested in the audit engagement. Ultimately, the objective of the SAUPs is to correct your internal control processes uh, in order to lessen the risks of fraud, waste, or abuse in the future. Um, I've said it before in different presentations that you can kind of compare um, your, you can look at your audit as like your annual checkup when you go to the doctor, right? But as I've gotten older, I've found out that there are specialized tests that you have to take now all of a sudden when you go to the doctor. And you can look at the SAUPs as kind of that specialized test that's looking at certain things, right? Versus your overall health. So your audit will give you kind of an overall health report sort of. And then these will come in and they're looking at sp particular things to see if these little small specific things are healthy. And you can use this to help improve your internal controls, implement internal controls, or modify your internal controls to help prevent 
any major issues down the road. And with that, we are now going to begin our panel discussion with Brian and um, Brandon. Uh, we're going to start off with Brian. Brian, oh, sorry, one second. Question. Okay, we have one question um, that I'm sure a lot of people um, are asking. Why isn't the issue date listed um, in not the same as the publishing date once the report is on the LLA website? Diane, you might have to answer that, but I'm, I've never been 100% sure about that. Brian Jobert can answer that, I think. Um. I would imagine that the the issue date is when the, the actual date of the report is, whereas the release date is when the legislative auditor has the time to review the report to make sure it complies with their standards and then actually puts it on their website. Absolutely correct. So there's the date of the audit report. There's the date that, that ends the auditor's responsibilities. There is the date that it was submitted to us, and then it sits in a queue because we review it, takes less than three weeks, and then we issue them on the website publicly. And we're just checking to make sure some kind of basic things are all um, correct in there. Any other questions? Barry, you wanna? Yeah, now and then we're gonna start the panel discussion. Um, Brian Jobert is going to start us off with the auditor's perspective of the SAUPs. Brian. All right, thank you, Barry. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I guess uh, the first thing I'd just like to thank Barry for inviting me over to this panel. Um, certainly appreciate it and get the opportunity to to speak to everyone. Um, I was going to kind of give our perspective. I know Barry wants to give us some opinions on uh, the opinions on the AUPs from the onset when they first were were rolled out, as opposed to maybe some of the opinions that are currently in place after we've had several years of implementing these. Um, so I think one of the one of the main questions that came out and probably still comes out today is is there truly a benefit to doing these agreed upon procedures? You know, there's tons of time being spent not only by the auditee but also by the auditor um, to to go through these procedures to make sure that uh, things are being done in accordance with those procedures. Um, so again, we have varying opinions on to on to whether or not they are beneficial. So I just wanted to cover some of the areas of where I think that they are beneficial. And to kind of answer the age old question is I think they are beneficial. And uh, I think that the fewer, the fewer exceptions that you have on your agreed upon procedures is a direct, a direct reflection to what happens on the audit side. Um, so w w one of the main areas that, that they try to enhance is really the written policies and procedures. I think one of that's one of, one of the biggest areas to start with. You know, it gives audits the opportunity to implement policy procedures that incorporates key elements of controls. Um, prior, prior to implementation of the agreed upon procedures, um, there's a lot of entities out there that either had policy procedures that hadn't been updated for years, and in some cases, decades. Um, and then you had some of the smaller entities that didn't have any written policies and procedures. Um, although they had some verbal, it just wasn't written down. Um, so I think it was a good time and it was a good idea to have these procedures formally written down um, so that the auditees can go through and identify these areas where key control should be established. Um, so really I think it just gave everybody the opportunity to evaluate their current process and make sure they have controls in place um, to cover those key transactions within their organization. And at the end of the day, once you make those policy procedures and you make sure that you implemented them, all it does really is provide for a more efficient um, a, a, a processing of transactions. So I think it's very important to get those policy procedures in place and written down. And I find it surprising that that was one of the top exceptions um, within this past 12 year, 12 month cycle. Um, there are examples of policy procedures, I'm sure you're all aware. There are some best practices that are on the legislative auditor's website. Um, so if you're having troubles with where to begin on some of these procedures, a good idea is to go to their website and look at some of those examples they have for their policies and procedures. Okay. Um, so, oh, <laughs> maybe a little bit too loud. Um, I think another area where it's very, very beneficial to auditees 
um, is that the legislative auditor takes the time to evaluate uh, th these procedures each year and update it for any current trends or any uh, additional issues that are coming out during the year. Uh, I know this past, I think this past cycle, they in, they included the uh, the testing of ACH transactions. And, you know, it kind of coincided with the growing trend that we're seeing with auditees is a lot of people are going through, a, going to ACH transactions and some entities are even trying to eliminate paper checks altogether. So it really came at a good time that you're testing those controls over those ACH transactions. Um, another area is, is really just to make sure you have policies and procedures in place when you're establishing those ACH transactions. Um, make sure that you have something in place to set up the financial information and also to change the financial information. Just to give you a little bit of feedback, in the, in the last 12 months, I've had three separate entities that were subject to email fraud. Um, within those three entities, over $620,000 was given to fraudsters. Um, so just between three, the highest one, one transaction was around 245,000. Um, so if you think it doesn't, it can't happen, it can happen. Um, and two of the entities, uh, it was the auditee's email that was compromised. And one of the other entities, it was a vendor's, a vendor of the auditee that their email was compromised. In two of the cases, it was, uh, it was, it was, to set up ACH tra transactions newly. So they weren't previously paying these vendors by ACH, but they requested through email to get, um, to get paid through ACH instead of receiving that, that check. Um, so of course the, the auditee did just go ahead and change that information and submitted that payment request without verifying it through the, the, the actual vendor. Um, so you need to make sure that you have policies and procedures in place to verify uh, these emails that are coming through, make sure that they are, are, are correct. And that is what the intentions of your vendor is. And then on the other vendor, the, the, the issue was that the, the, um, the, the vendor was already set up on ACH transactions and they, apparently they had access to their email for quite some time because they knew that the auditee was making payments by ACH. Uh, so of course they sent an email to the auditee saying that they they had opened a new bank account to to please change their routing information um of course it was changed and not verified and hence the uh the, the fraud was 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 taken um so it's to be very careful to make sure that you are um, implementing policies and procedures and just to give a little feedback on one of the the auditees when talking to the cfo she did mention you know, she said brian we have policies and procedures in place for this kind of stuff it was just a busy time of the year when it, when it was requested. And for some reason, it just got biased. Um, so it can happen to anyone. So even though you have those policies and procedures in place, it's really to make sure that you are following them, even at times where it may not be as convenient to follow them. And moving on to another part of that is your information technology areas of the agreed upon procedures. You know, part of the information technology uh, procedures is to attend and uh, do cyber uh, uh, cybersecurity training um, in order to comply with state statute. So had had they did their cybersecurity training, could these transactions, uh, could, could this have been prevented? Um, to So, you know, if, you, if you're asking yourself, are these procedures worth it? Are they beneficial? Really and truly, if you follow these procedures and you do what they're asking and you comply and try and have minimal exceptions, you can possibly prevent some fraud from happening within your entity. Um, another big area in the information technology is making sure that your technology assets um, have the most current versions of your other software and our virus software as well. Um, so you want to make sure everything's current. So hopefully it may detect if your email is subject to um, an attack. Um, so overall, to, to kind of answer the question is, in, in doing these procedures over the, the past years, you know, in the beginning, I was kind of on the fence with everyone else. Is there really a benefit to doing all these procedures? I think we're kind of blindsided with the amount of time that it was going to take to perform these and for the RITs to implement, um, that we didn't really see the big picture on it. Um, but now hindsight, going back and looking at it, we really do see the benefit coming years after where these procedures have been developed and put into place. Um, and, and really and truly, as we go through the audits, 
what we're seeing on our end as well is the ones that have the fewer exceptions or no exceptions, we're seeing increased efficiencies in their audit. So it's really taking less time to do their audit, which hopefully would minimize your audit costs. Um, is it going to completely uh, erase the fact that you have to pay for the agreed upon procedures? Probably not, but it should lessen the gaps um, as long as you're following up and making sure those exceptions are clear. Um, so again, overall, I really think that they are beneficial and I think you should take advantage of, 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 of trying to uh, get rid of all those exceptions within your agreed upon procedures. Um, other than that, I think I can turn it back over. Barry. So we have an auditor question. Okay. And our auditor question is, if during the course of the statewide AUP testing, you found that there was an outdated written policy like you had mentioned, and the client updates that during the course of the statewide AUPs, would that still be an exception to that written policy and procedure in the year you're auditing? I would say if the procedure was updated after their fiscal year end, I would say it would still be an exception. Agreed. Uh, Barry, we have a question for you. And the question for you is, do you have a certain website that's recommended for that cybersecurity training? So the, the Department of uh, Civil Service, they actually have um, a cybersecurity training that is available. Um, but you do have to make a request to the civil service to get a copy of it. Um, and I think it's like they give, uh, you have to fill out some paperwork to make that request and they'll send it to you. But I believe it's, if I'm not, Correct. Excuse me, but I believe it's just one copy of it, and you can use it amongst uh, your staff. Um, but I have been told before that it's kind of up to management to decide what um, cybersecurity training meets the requirements of the law and also meets the needs of your entity. Um, and management can use their discretion to uh, pick whatever cybersecurity training they want. But that's that that training on the civil services website is available to you all. Uh, training uh, or yes okay it is thank you all right um, if that's all the questions then now we will have Brandon Boylan uh, he will give you the auditees perspective thank you Barry um, I'm again honored to be here um, and uh, to, to talk about statewide EUPs um, I know they can be scaring scary and overwhelming at first, um, especially, you know, if you're looking at it uh, for the first time, um, you know, I, I know I was a bit overwhelmed at first as well. Uh, but if you take each one, um, kind of break it down, kind of how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? And, uh, you know, I, I think the best way to to go about it is look at, look at two each month um, throughout the year. So that way, you know, review, especially your policies and procedures, um, take two a month and review them, update them, uh, if necessary. Um, at the city of Gonzales, we had a bank, uh, a bank wreck finding a couple years ago. Uh, and looking at the, the slide earlier, um, I know I'm not alone. Um, 638 uh, audit or uh, statewide AUP exceptions on bank recs. So just know, you know, nobody's perfect on this. Uh, we do have 802 no exceptions. So that's fantastic. Um, but there's a lot of us out there, 5,309 5, exceptions in total. So you're not alone. Lean on your brothers and sisters at, you know, your neighboring uh, municipalities, reach out to each other for help. Um, and uh and yeah we're all we're all in this together um the legislative auditors website has great is a great resource so is gfoa um the legislative auditors uh youtube channel with uh past clg training is is also a great resource um i kind of think of the statewide aups and we had talked about uh it earlier as being the baseline that's your foundation 
Um, so you can go above and beyond that. Uh, in one area, we were just talking about the IT training uh, that the city does is we do it every year because why not? There's always changes in, in IT, uh, especially with AI. So, you know, if you do it this, this year and you wait five years to do IT training again, you know, you could start falling behind and especially, you know, those ACH, uh, stories are, are extremely scary. So we all got to take our time on those uh, and make sure we have the proper policies and procedures to verify uh, when those changes come through. Don't don't just take an email, uh, you know, implement some kind of call, some kind of in-person uh, procedure. Uh, I know it might take a little bit more time, but it's, it's well worth it. Um, and, you know, again, I know we talked about, you know, the difference between, um, in the regular financial report audit and the statewide AUPs. Um, and yes, you know, there is an expense to it, but I think the overall value of it is, is tremendous. Um, I kind of think of it as kind of like offensive insurance, um, or in other words, you know, it helps prevent bigger issues down the line. Um, I'm sure uh, a lot of you uh, have heard of the, uh, the story of all the Queen's horses uh, with Rita Crunwell. Uh, $53.7 million fraud over 22 years in, in this little small town that no one, no one expected that. So it, it could be happening in our backyards and we don't know it. I think that's what the statewide AUPs really uh, helps target. And I love the example, um, Barry, on the, uh, on the health screening. You know, you catch that cancer at an earlier stage versus you catch it at stage four you know, you have a much, much better chance at stopping uh, that and treating it before it becomes a big, big problem, uh, like in the All the Queen's Horses uh, case. Um, again, fo focus on focus on the small things. Uh, the small things turn into big things. So we take care of the small things and that takes care of the big things. Um, and again, I think it's it's really it's really the foundation of of what we should all do. Uh, be doing and you can always add on top of that because each 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 place is different the city of gonzalez is different than the city of walker or uh, the city of zachary or the city of donaldsonville um but we all need to stay in communication with e with each other and help each other out um and yeah i think uh if again if i'm always a resource as well if if y'all have any questions uh for me feel free to reach out and i'm more than willing to help. So we do have um, a question from regarding from this is from a nonprofit. So their question is if they have a um, budget or a contract under five hundred thousand dollars, do they need to have the statewide um, agreed upon procedures? This is a five hundred one c three organization. Are they required to have an audit? I mean, if they. Um I don't know if they, they if it's under five hundred thousand dollars. That's the total public money that they have. Then they would not be required to do an audit. Therefore, they would not have to do an SAUP. Can organizations right. that are not required to have statewide AUPs still perform statewide AUPs? I don't see why not. Yeah, I mean, if, if you choose to do so, I think that would be fine. <laughs> All right. Is it yep, that is correct. And for the quasi publics, it's it's your public fund revenue. Mm -hmm. So um, and public funds are uh, there's there's a uh, resource on our website that will help identify which are your public funds, loans, grants from the state, um, from another government uh, or that. So things like if you have membership dues, that that's not considered public funds. So you don't take your total revenue, you just take your public fund revenue. And if it's 500,000 or more, yes, you will have to have the statewide AUPs, but maybe not all statewide AUPs apply to those public funds. For example, if you did not use the public funds for payroll, there's a statewide AUP on payroll that the auditor would answer what one for that, Brian? Not applicable. It would not be applicable in that situation. 
and uh, and that is in the instructions uh, talks about nonprofits and that that sort of thing. It's in the SAUP instructions. It is discussed. So I would encourage you all to read those instructions. To you know, if you if you have any special circumstances that uh, may be uh, present at your entity, um, I will tell you from my perspective at the auditor's office. Um, I believe that the SAUPs have proven to kind of uh, to be like like Brian said. A, a foundation for for internal controls at your organizations. Um, you know, you have changes in administration, um, and sometimes when you have those changes, uh, I've I've heard from like newly elected officials or whatever, and they'll say those previous people didn't do anything right. We didn't, you know, the way they did it wasn't right. We need to change all of that. Um, I will tell you that these agreed upon procedures can be used as a foundation for your entity when developing your internal controls. Um, but I will encourage you, um, Brian said, it, I mean, uh, Brandon said it would be a good idea to do so, but I would definitely encourage you to go above and beyond what's being tested in those SAUPs. Um, because like he said, every entity is different. Um, you can be the same type of entity you can be a municipality, but there are different sizes of municipalities, right? Um, you're located in different ge geographic areas and may have different, uh, you know, things that you have to consider as you perform the functions of your entity. You may have different tax structures or funding sources. Um, this, you have to consider the size of your staff. You have to consider um, the, the expertise of your staff and what functions and services you provide to your constituents. All of that needs to be taken into consideration when developing your internal controls, including your written policies and procedures. Um, and I'm one of the people that are like a real big proponent of written policies and procedures. I think that without written policies and procedures, it's really, not, it's very difficult to have effective internal controls, period. Um, I compare it to like um, a coach, a football coach, right? Do we have any football fans in here? Anybody like Saints fans or LSU fans, Southern fans? Uh, Grambling fans, even. <laughs> no. Uh, um, so, <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so it, these, these coaches, um, you can't always tell. If you're a Saints fan, you cannot tell that they're actually game planning at this point if you are as frustrated with them as I am. But they spend a lot of time studying their opponent. They spend a lot of time, you know, looking at game film, uh, looking at their own personnel and the capabilities of their personnel to figure out what the game plan is uh, for their entity to ensure that that team has success. And that's what your written policies and procedures are. Uh, management should not just throw together, you know, written policies and procedures to satisfy what's in the SAUPs. While that is a start, you should also consider all of the, 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 the realistic scenarios that are in place at your entity and the things that you face and the functions of your operations in order to, in the, in the uh, skill set of your, your staff and the, um, the number of staff that you have. Um, and you put together those, those, those procedures um, so that your staff will know what's required of them um, and when it's required of them, who's responsible for what um, the, and the, um, you know, the, the, the repercussions for not doing what you're supposed to do. All of that can be in your written policies and procedures, and it can help um, you institute those internal controls to prevent those uh, small problems from, from becoming larger issues for your entity. Um, I will also say that I have found um, that I've had a lot of people from entities and CPAs contact me um, because clients are like, or the, the auditees are like, well, we didn't know we were required to take this training, or we didn't know about this training. Where did this training come from? Um, and while most of this training has been tested for a while now, it still appears to be new to some uh, entities. And a lot of that could be due to newly elected people not being aware of it and the like. Um, and though it is ultimately management's responsibility to be aware of what trainings and what laws are you know, required uh, to be followed, I have found that some of the compliance things that are tested in the SAUPs are unfortunately how some entities find out about the required training or the different requirements that are uh, needed and are necessary to be met. Um, along those same lines, I will tell you, um, in order to help avoid getting those exceptions, a great idea would be able to would be to look at our website. Our legal staff, uh, led by Jennifer Shea, 
they put together uh, a wonderful document that talks about all of the training that is required by uh, you know local government employees um, in the, in the state. It, it lays out the different trainings that are required. They also have some white papers about all of the you know the the the, the laws that you guys need to follow, as, as specifically like the prevention of sexual harassment stuff. They have a white paper on that. So these types of things are 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 there for you um, in order to prevent those exceptions from occurring. But I will say that, unfortunately, again, these exceptions occur. People find out that these things are expected of them. And then hopefully going forward, uh, they don't have repeat exceptions in those compliance areas. Um, so that's just my perspective um, of, of what some of the benefit is. I will encourage you that if you do get an exception in any category, that you take it serious um, and that you work hard to correct that exception and don't just ignore it because it's not an audit finding. Um, I know I've heard from auditors before that there are clients that don't care about the SAUP exception. They only care about the audit finding. Um, I would encourage you to care about both um, because like we said, if you have weaknesses in your internal controls that are found in the SAUPs and you don't correct them, then that can lead to bigger issues down the line, the least of which could be, um, you know, uh, audit finding. And and worse would be if you have some sort of fraud, as, as Brian discussed uh, a minute ago. Um, so, you know, with that said, I think we, we are ready to, to open the floor for questions. Um, and we, we want you guys to ask all of the questions that you, that you, oh, Brian. Brandon, you have something you yeah, want to Yeah, I just add? wanted to, a, a thought just popped in my head. Uh -huh. it, it's kind of like when you have um, statewide AUP exceptions, it's kind of like having a crack in your foundation. And if you don't address it sooner, you, you're going to have much bigger problems. I don't know. I, I like metaphors and that, that just came to mind when you were talking. So I just wanted to share that. It's kind of like having a crack in your foundation. You want to address it as soon as possible. What's the objective of statewide AUPs? The objective is to correct internal control issues at your entity. Um, like we said before, these can find problems at a very, you know, low level. It could be a five dollar transaction that wasn't, you know, approved, didn't have all the, the appropriate documentation attached to that transaction, or maybe it didn't have signatures on it when it should have had those signatures. Um, and while it may not seem like a major issue for that $5 transaction, if that had been a larger transaction, that could cause you guys much bigger issues. Um, and again, your auditor is probably not looking at a $5 transaction during their audit process. So by having those things tested um, at that level in the SAUPs, it can bring to your attention any areas where maybe someone is not doing their job, right? Maybe they're, they, or maybe there was a mistake and you can figure out how to correct that mistake um, at that, at that point um, and make sure that everybody's doing what they need to do so that you have a consistent um, operation in order to pre prevent any major issues um, down the line. Any other questions? We please, please ask as many questions as you have and don't be shy. <laughs> this is one of our uh, most requested topics. Um, we get this a lot. So what we thought here, instead of going over all the details of the statewide AUPs, which are on our website, lla.la.gov, and version 7 is posted there. Um, all the instructions are there, as well as we have some frequently asked questions, because we do anticipate questions on the year one and the year two cycle um, for that. So we um, have some of those posted there. So this is really your chance to ask all of your burning questions um, uh, about these procedures. I'm going to I'm going to start off by asking. Um, I'm going to ask a general question to you guys. So um, what advice would you give to a brand new finance director who's got to go through the statewide AUPs for the first time? I think each one of you should answer that question. Well, the first thing that I that I would do is read them, right? Go through the the SAUPs and become familiar with them so that you know what's, you know, coming down the line, what your auditor will be asking you for and what testing will be performed at your agency. I'm pretty much on the same boat with Barry. You really have to go through and 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 look at those procedures and try and understand what they're asking and what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to put in place. 
And when all else fails, if you have questions, that's why your auditor's there as well. Um, be sure and reach out to them, and we can try and field any questions you might have. And if we can answer the questions, we certainly don't mind reaching out to the Le Legislative Auditor's Office. Um, so you have some other resources available in order to try and help you get through those AEPs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would reach out uh, to my auditor first. Uh, I love audio visual, so I would go to YouTube, watch uh, the past, go to the legislative auditors, YouTube, uh, watch those past trainings that Barry and Diane gave. Uh, great, great resource there. Um, and also, you know, re read the statewide EUPs, but hearing it while you're reviewing it, um, I think is a huge, huge benefit. Uh, you should take advantage of that. And Brandon is being being humble. He also has a very good SAUP presentation that's on our website as he did a presentation uh, on SAUPs this past spring. Yeah. So so yeah, so you have you have a multiple presenters of the same topic that are available for you to view on the C CLGE um, section of our website. Actually, you can go to directly to YouTube and search for it, or you can go to our website and go to the Center for Local Government Excellence or the CLGE section and all of the uh, videos from previous CLG workshops are on there for you to view. Absolutely. And reach out to your, uh, your neighbor and finance directors as well. And um, if you have any particular questions or specific questions about SAUPs, please feel free to reach out to me and I will try my best to assist you guys. So Brian, I have an auditor question for you because this is a common one that we get. Auditees know they have an audit. And so can you explain the relationship and the different work that you do and how statewide AUPs interact with the also the audit procedures that you have and how you feel about having to perform both of those for an audit? But the, the, the procedures that are done for the, AU, the, the statewide agreed upon procedures, again, kind of like Barry said, those are much at or, or a much lower level of transactions. Um, so although a, a, a $10 charge on a credit card may not be a, 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 a significant item for a city where they may have you know $10 million of revenues coming through, um, for the AUPs, that $10 transaction is relevant to make sure that there are controls in place to make sure that um, those are being properly documented and approved. Um, so that's kind of the, the difference between it's a lot lower level transactions. But again, as Barry mentioned before, if you take care of the lower level transactions, your higher level transactions should be covered. Um, so as long as you have the right processes in place, those higher dollar uh, transactions will be covered. And when we're testing those higher dollar, dollar value transactions within your audit, uh, you're less likely to have any kind of exceptions or audit findings with those. All right, we have a question for uh, Brandon. Um, what improvements, you mentioned that your experience was that you had an exception under bank reconciliations. So how did you approach how to resolve that? And what improvements have you seen um, to your internal controls as a result of having an SAUP exception. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the finding that we had on bank recs um, was uh, pretty pretty basic um, uh, in, in terms of just how to resolve it. Uh, we just didn't do it on time. So what we had to do was just focus on make that a higher priority schedule that uh I've, I've become a big fan of scheduling time uh on my calendar on my work calendar so that hey when it's when it comes time to do it you know whatever you got to do uh move heaven and earth close your door focus on bank recs from uh from you know point point a to point b um and and get it done some other findings uh or exceptions might not be as uh, simple to resolve um but I think it also is a good communication tool as well. Uh, we never want findings or exceptions, but when we do have that, you know, open communication uh, with our leaders and our team is is super important uh, because it, it takes a village. It, it really does. Um, uh, you know, and the more help you get with it, uh, the better off uh, we all are. So, yeah. So either Barry or Brian on this one, 
Um, do you have any examples where a statewide AUP exception actually resulted in the discovery of a significant issue at an agency? Um, I actually did have an issue with uh, credit cards, um, some credit card transactions that were being done. And because it was lower level items, of course, there were some, some things that were, were purchased that should have been purchased, such as food um, and even in some cases, some outlandish tips uh, being left at restaurants. So some things like that you, we, we, we could have never identified during the audit. Um, so it was during the AUP process that came about. And of course, because we found those exceptions within the AUPs, we actually extended the procedures on the audit side and we're able to identify even more transactions that were going on within the credit cards. I know um, there was there was at least one instance where uh, under the fraud, um, the fraud notice section, which seems like a pretty, pretty simple one. Uh, one but one of the questions that we ask is whether or not there was a fraud and whether it was uh, reported to the DA and to our office. And I know that there was at least one time where there was a fraud that was uh, that occurred, but it had not been reported to the DA in our office. And as a result of that exception, um, you know, it ended up being properly reported thereafter. So I would say that that was a pretty, you know, significant uh, thing that was uncovered um, during SAUP testing. Barry, this is a question for you, and Brian had kind of alluded to it. Um, how do you ensure that the statewide AUPs remain relevant and adaptable, you know, to like things like pain by ACH and other thing, changes in processes? Well, I'll tell you, me, Diane and myself, we meet every year and try to determine whether or not there are things we need to add to the statewide agreed upon procedures, uh, whether any of the things that are already in the SAUPs need to be removed because they're outdated or no longer relevant. Um, we try to consider, you know, what's going on in the world, what we're seeing at different entities as far as the ACH stuff, as an example. Uh, but we also know a lot more of these transactions are occurring online and digitally now, right? A lot of transactions, are you never even see a check or any dollars. Everything is done digitally. And as that continues to increase, we look at it every year and are trying to figure out ways that we can add uh, different testing, different procedures that test, you know, those transactions. Um, but I would also encourage you all as the auditees, and I would also encourage auditors, you know, to, to contact us and give us your ideas of what you're seeing at your entities so that we can be aware of the types of things you're seeing and we can consider those things when we are uh, considering changes to the SAUPs. Um, we all know that the world is a rapidly changing place, um, especially with the advent of, like Brandon said, that the artificial intelligence and different things like that, things are really moving quickly. And um, it's hard to stay ahead of all of those changes, um, but um, we, we would like to work with you all to make sure that we are, you know, implementing um, relevant testing um, that, you know, things that are actually happening. We don't want you to have things that are tested that are no longer even something that goes on at your entities. We want it to be things that are actually occurring at your entities. So like I said, uh, your feedback is welcomed and we and we, we, we really would appreciate it from you all. Um, if you have any comments, criticisms, or anything from about SAUPs, please reach out to me and let me know. My feelings will not be hurt one way or another. Uh, just, you know, just keep us up to up to date about what's going on and what types of things uh, we may need to consider looking at. Or if something is in the SAUPs that, you know, you may say this doesn't even happen anymore. Nobody does this anymore. All of that can be taken into consideration when we make those annual changes to these uh, statewide agreed upon procedures. And really to reiterate, the statewide AUPs address areas that have the highest risk of fraud, waste, and abuse. So we're not checking everything. Um, during this morning's sessions, we got a question, will we change the statewide AUPs for the new requirements in the open meetings law? And that answer is no. You know, this, there's an audit, there is a compliance questionnaire, and uh, the compliance questionnaire is the auditee has to fill that out and say, yes or no, I complied with all these laws, one of which is open meetings law. And that then is, is adopted by the governing body and is given to the auditor at the start of the audit. 
and the auditor goes through and checks those responses. So they will check the response that way on the open meetings law. So the statewide AUPs are not going to replace an audit. Um, that's not what they're for. They just address these areas of the highest um, fraud, um, w waste, and abuse for that. Um, Brandon, I have a question for you. Um, as someone who's undergone these now for a few years, what did you really find that was the most surprising and challenging as you were as you became the auditee for these? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, surprising and challenging. I think just the you know kind of what Barry was talking about, just the the evolution. Uh, that question earlier um, is the in the flexibility of it and as as we're all um as we're all challenged you know in in the ever-changing world um uh it's you know it it's really good to hear that you know we can go to the legislative auditor uh with our you know the issues that we're having because that that's you know they they want to help us all be good stewards of of the public funds um and i think that's I think that was really the most surprising uh, aspect to it is, uh, you know, it is it is pretty overwhelming at first. But when you when you really get down to the core of it, it's really helping us all be better uh, stewards of the public funds. Um, you know, so and, and especially when I see the you know, all the exceptions uh, around the state, you know, it, that's that's really good to see um that we're not alone out there um you know so we can really lean on each other uh lean on the legislative auditor for help uh and guidance on that uh to be the best uh stewards of public funds that that we can be and and i will say if you look at that chart that's included um in this presentation about the the number of findings there are 802 reports that had no saup exceptions which means that there are entities out there that have no exceptions. Um, and with the number of entities that had no exceptions, it, it's likely that you all know some of those entities, people at those entities. I would encourage you to talk to them and see what they're doing to prevent these exceptions, right? See what they did to resolve their exceptions. Like, like Brandon said, you know, you guys can work together and just try to figure out what, what's being done in other places to make sure that your internal controls are functioning uh, properly and that uh, you have all the, the right internal controls in place to prevent these exceptions. Yes. How many entities comprise or, or made 2191? Put the slide for the exceptions up, so that's her question right there 2191 yeah. responses yeah well that that number does include some entities that have submitted two reports during that time period so if you had a report that was due by 331 you may have submitted two reports by that period so it's not necessarily the number of entities it's the number of reports that we received during that period and i know initially these were going to be done every year and mm -hmm. then y'all changed it to you know the ones you pass, you don't have to do the next year, and then y'all went back to every year, mm -hmm. and now we're back to every other year. Is that likely to change again? I don't Michelle, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's possible that it could change again. We don't foresee it at this point, all right? So it, it, it depends on what we see. If we see that in year one, people become lax, or if we start seeing that, you know, people are, uh, that there's things that are occurring across the state that these could have caught, then maybe we do make a change. Um, but as of right now, being that this is the first year of this implementation, we have not considered whether it will be changed going forward. Um, we will see how it all turns out, right? And then we will, we will make changes if necessary. Barry, why don't you go over some of the scenarios that you worked on and how you came up with the two-year cycle and why? Remember, we looked at like a, a longer cycle than that and did, did rejected that one. Why don't you go over how you came up with this? Okay. Oh, well, initially we, we considered possibly three years, possibly four years, you know, um, but the, the, we were, we were afraid that if we let it go too long without having exception, uh, the testing performed, uh, during that time you could have administration changes, you could have turnover in personnel, uh, you could have policy changes and the like that would 
possibly change what's going on at the entity um, if you waited so long. So we figured that by doing it every other year or having that two year cycle anyway, um, you know, if you missed one year of testing and you didn't have exceptions, we can we can assume that those same procedures are in place for that second year and that nothing major would occur during that time. Um, and then knowing that it would be tested again in that, you know, that third year, I guess, um, it would keep you aware that, you know, someone will look at it again. It's not like it won't ever be looked at again. Um, and it, we, we hope that it keeps people, you know, uh, on top of everything so that there are no major issues. But uh, we did want to, you know, create a way to give some cost savings to those of you who are working hard at it and correcting those things. Uh, you know, we want to give you some incentive and some 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 ability to see some cost savings. So um, we considered a number of scenarios, um, length of time being one of them. Um, you know, we went back and forth about whether the information technology uh, category should be tested every year or should we give that break to everybody in the second year or how we should do that. Um, again, we, we, we settled on this because we think that it is that proper balance of, you know, giving some cost break to, and, 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 you know, giving you some of your time back as well, not having to have that SAUP testing performed, um, while also ensuring that these areas are being looked at often enough to help prevent any major issues from occurring at your entities. An excellent motivator, you know, because we're always looking for ways to save money at nonprofits. So that was really good. Well, I'm glad to hear. I hope, I hope I hope everyone takes you know advantage of it. It would be great if you know everyone resolves all of their exceptions and prevents them from happening, and no one has to do SAUPs in that year or two cycle. Uh, so we want we want everyone to work hard to have that become reality, um, and you know work with your auditor, give us a call, and we'll we'll try to help you all out as much as possible to help you down that path to uh, having no no exceptions. And that was really Mike Wagaspak's, you know, mantra to us was try to develop a cost savings um, in here now that they've been out for a while. Correct. Um, Brian, I have a question for you. Um, uh, maybe, Brandon, you may want to chime in as well. How can both the auditee and the auditor um, improve communication during this SAUP process? That is a good question. Um, you know, as far as improving communication, we're always open to field any questions that the auditees may have, um, and we try to provide a response as quickly as possible. Um, I don't know that there really is a true communication problem between the auditors and auditees, at least in the cases that I see. Um, I, I think there's open lines, and the auditees feel free to contact us with any questions, not only for AUPs, but also audit-related questions. Um, and I feel it's a good idea for them also to reach out and communicate before it becomes an issue. Um, so if you're unaware or unsure how to do something, reach out beforehand so it doesn't become and rise to that, that level. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're in communication with our auditors all throughout the year. Uh, when, when we have a question, when we're considering a policy change, uh, I'll reach out to my auditor and say, hey, you know, would this impact uh, either the audit or the statewide AUPs? Um, and, and ask them for advice first. And if they're not sure, they'll reach out to the LLA uh, from time to time as well. Um, so definitely stay in touch with your auditor uh, throughout the year. Um, and kind of, um, I, I love the, the, uh, the every other year, you know, cost savings, but, you know, just encourage everybody, stay on top of those, you know, reviewing it, you know, work hard and, you know, hopefully we can maintain that every other year. Um, uh, little discount there so absolutely and, and to kind of add on the on the, the on the new version of the agreed upon procedures um, there's been talks about this potentially coming to light at previous conferences um, so going through some of the the um, the finalization of reports in the past I've been mentioning to some of the auditees that this was coming uh, potentially coming and, and kind of waiting for approval and there's a lot of excitement that I saw within the auditees of the potential of saving money, so especially in the nonprofit area. Um, they're looking any ways that they can to try and save some money, and a lot of those are, are very excited about trying to get no exceptions in order to maximize that cost savings. Absolutely. So um, 
I will ask uh, you guys, I know there are a lot of misconceptions out there. So um, why don't each one of you say what a misconception is and what the, if you have one, and what the correct response or perception should be. Um, I'll just throw one up like, if you have no exceptions to statewide AUPs, does that mean there's no fraud happening? No. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> That's right. Just means the auditor didn't catch it. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, th I think that is a, a common misconception. And uh, like I think Diane or Barry talked earlier, uh, this is the the highest um, uh, the highest risk areas here. Um, there could be other areas uh, uh, where there's issues that that go undetected. Um, so that's why you know at each agency we need to design internal controls above and beyond uh, the statewide AUPs uh, that tailor uh, to our specific uh, entities. Um, so yeah, I think I think, and to kind of speak more to misconception, I think because I had that misconception at first that this was when I first heard about it, when it first came out, I was like, Oh, these are best practices, which is really, really cool. Um, but then I learned a couple of years in that, no, this is, this is to correct, uh, internal, uh, controls. Um, and this is the baseline, this is the foundation. So once that kind of clicked, uh, I, I saw it a little bit differently and I learned to appreciate it a lot, lot more. So, yeah, uh, along those same lines, I think, you know, it's important to remember that the things that are tested in the SAUPs are not, it's not testing everything. It's not testing every area of risk at your agency. It's also not testing compliance with everything that you are required to comply with. Um, that's why it's important that you, you know, stay abreast of what's going on in the legislature, what laws are being passed, uh, what new requirements may, uh, you know, be, be, be instituted that affect your agencies. Um, we only test a small portion of what you guys are required to comply with. Um, so why, so while, um, you know, these procedures may be how some people find out about some of the requirements that the law mandates of them, um, and some of the trainings and, and, and things like that, uh, it's not, it doesn't cover everything. So I would encourage you, you know, to make sure that again, you're going above and beyond and you're staying aware of what, what the law requires you on the requires of you on the compliance side and that you are also considering the risks um, that you have throughout your agency and your operations, not only what's tested in the SAUPs. Same thing. So going back again to my question, the AUPs and the SAUPs, and I, and I am with the school district. Well, yeah. So when I look at it, and that sometimes I feel like I'm being charged by it, because sometimes the testing that they're doing is the same thing. Like you're testing me on the payroll side, and you give me names, and then you're testing me again on the state AUP, and it's with the same names. That it's like, okay, why are you testing me twice? You just did it here, so. Yeah. Clarification. Yeah. Well, they, they are separate. Uh, the SAUPs are something that our, that our office requires, um, while school districts, um, they have to do those agreed upon procedures. And I think it's that DOE that requires those. So it's, it's separate. Um, and while some of the testing may be similar, um, they, are, they are separate. I mean, they're different requirements um, that, that, that are there. And there are other entities that have, you know, there are other AUPs that are performed for certain types of entities. Um, but overall, mo most entities only have the SAUPs, um, but school districts are a little bit different. So uh, an agreed upon procedure is a terminology and auditing standards. And, um, and these are performed according to those standards. And basically in those, the auditor will do exactly what is stated and no more and cannot exercise professional judgment. So you, that's why you see all these verbs like observe whether this, 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 this is done. Where in an audit, um, an auditor does um, exercise professional judgment. So Bessie has its own required agreed upon procedures that relate to something totally different 
than the agreed upon procedures that are the statewide ones. And then um, if you are a state agency, there are also yet a third set of agreed upon procedures there. But there are also, it, like I say, it's a generic term in the auditing standards. So for example, to our school district friends, sometimes our school districts will contract with a firm to say, go look at our school activity funds and um, see if they're following our procedures that are laid out in our school activity fund manual. That is not an audit that is an agreed upon procedure. So it's kind of a generic term and there may be more than one for that. Um, let's see, I had a question on that. Uh, Brian, this one is for you. Can an auditee request that an audit be uh, performed, um, that an audit be to be done just to see if fraud has occurred? Correct, yes, you can request to have a, a, a fraud examination. I believe those engagements would need to get approval through your office, um, but yes, there could be something done in order to determine whether fraud has existed. And how is that different from a financial statement audit? It's, it's looking into certain transactions or certain events that um, that you're concerned with, whereas an audit is for the financial statements in total. Right, to express an opinion on that. Um, so, all right, let me see. I had one more question for you. Let's see who to ask this to. Um, I'm gonna ask this to Brandon and then Brian, your secondary. So as your auditor is there going through the statewide AUPs and oh, lo and behold, you encounter an issue. Um, what steps should you take? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, communication with your auditor um, as to, um, of course, what the finding is. Uh, communication with your team uh, as to how, uh, how the exception uh, occurred. Um, what was the, what was the root source, uh, of the exception? Um, you know, if it's a policy and procedure, um, that we just don't have, uh, that's, you know, a bit easier. We adopt those policies. If it's, if it's a situation where we have a policy and procedure in place and those policies and procedures weren't being followed, uh, try to find the root source of that, uh, find out why, uh, it wasn't being followed and what can be done to correct that uh, and moving forward, how, how can we prevent that? Um, so that's, that's how I would address it. And, and more on our end is, you know, if an issue is brought to our attention, um, the, the main thing is to try and find out more details about what transpired and try to determine if, um, if, if other testing is required, what's, you know, what's the impact of this potential issue? Um, so we, we basically just find more questions and potentially do more, more, more testing or more investigation of what was really happening. Right. Is it a one-off or is it indicative of a, of a larger of issue? A fund, yes. Yep. Absolutely. So I would just want to take the opportunity to remind you that the auditee and the auditor are on the same side. They're not on opposing sides. They are one team. And how, how does a team operate best when they communicate, when they're talking with each other? when they have frequent communication. So it's not that, oh, I hope the auditor doesn't find this. It's like, I have no clue how to record this transaction. Never seen it before in my life. I don't even know where to look to find out how to record this transaction, but I've got my auditor on speed dial. Let me call him and he'll start getting me in the right direction um, to be able to do those things. So think of your auditor as like a, a phone a friend person that you can call and ask. And that call will save you from a lot of trouble because auditors do not like it when they come to audit and they find something really goofy and they, they are, they may have found that for an example, like this is a pretty complex transaction. You know, now I'm going to have to do an audit adjustment because you got it wrong. That results in a finding. You should have called me first, you know, and you're just a day late and a dollar short for that, you know, um, for that. So auditors really, they, they really, really do want to help. Um, and one thing is Brian will tell you, he won't say it, but I'm going to say it. 
that, you know, when they find an audit finding, they have all this documentation they have to do in the work paper. So just save them the trouble. All right. And with that, we want to very much thank our panelists for today. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much. And um, to close out, we really, really appreciate your attention today. It's been a long day. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you online who were with us. Um, if you won't be returning tomorrow, I mean, it's going to be a sad thing, but you really need to um, return tomorrow for our big discussion on water systems. But we will be sending out CPE certificates. We send those out in about, you have to give us two to three weeks to gather all of the data. There's a lot of data for that. We also, Liz will promptly tomorrow, probably before it ends, we'll send out a survey. So how did this presentation come about? How did the legal presentations come about this morning? The answers to the survey. So we, this is your program, we're just facilitators. So you say, I need more education on X, it's our job to get that education for you. We love to bring in people from the outside, like um, it's not just legislative auditor people. You know, there are a lot of experts out there and they come and help us get the answer. So we ask you pr please to fill out those surveys for us. And um, like I say, tomorrow, um, no pun intended, we will immerse ourselves in water. Um, a great big topic in Louisiana, very far reaching across the country. We have experts who have all the answers there to help. So safe travels this evening. Thank you so much and see you bright and early tomorrow morning. There'll be coffee.